And now let me introduce Jacob White from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, uh, and he'll be speaking on Cohen Macaulay hop monoids in species. Go ahead, Jacob. Thanks for the opportunity to speak at this conference, and thanks to the organizers for organizing this online conference. So I'm going to be talking about Cohen Macaulay hop monoids and species. I should mention that I first was introduced to the topic of hop monoids and species at FIPSAC in uh, 2008 when Marcelo Aguiar was one of the uh, plenary speakers. So it's nice to be able to actually talk on the same topic at another FIPSAC later. And so the goal is to try to provide a bridge between combinatorial hop algebras and uh, topological combinatorics. But to get there, first I want to talk about my motivation, where I'm coming from. So let's let H for right now just be a collection of combinatorial objects, like uh, just the collection of all graphs or all partially ordered sets or all matroids if you want. To each combinatorial object, like a graph, we have a polynomial invariant. Like say the uh, chromatic polynomial of a graph or the ordinal of a post set. And suppose you want to prove some result about your polynomial invariant for every object. We saw lots of examples of different questions you could have in the last talk, actually. For this talk, I'm actually going to focus on one particular property. So this is the setup. You've fixed your collection of combinatorial objects. You've fixed some sort of your favorite polynomial invariant. You want to prove some property for every single last polynomial invariant in your collection. The particular one I'm going to do is similar to the H star polynomial in the last talk, although it's slightly different. So the idea is you evaluate your polynomial at every non-negative integer and you create this power space. And it's known that you have a rational generating function, so you're going to get a rational function of this form where the numerator is also a polynomial. And so the question you want to prove, or the property you want to prove, is that these polynomials Oh, there's a typo there, that should be Z. You want to prove that these numerator polynomials all have non-negative coefficients. So for right now, let's just focus on one particular polynomial. So suppose you just have one. Well, what's one approach you can prove, use to prove non-negativity of these coefficients? Well, maybe you get, get lucky and this polynomial that you're interested in, say the chromatic polynomial, is actually the Hilbert polynomial of some relative simplicial complex. So remember, a relative simplicial complex is a collection of sets. So for instance, these triangles represent sets of size three, the edges represent sets of size two, and the vertices represent sets of size one. A relative simplicial complex consists of a pair of simplicial complexes where gamma is a subcomplex. And so for my pictures, these subcomplexes are dashed lines in red. So the red edges and the red vertices are in gamma. Everything you see is in sigma. And yes, it spells out FIPSAC online. So the important thing, here's the definition of a Hilbert polynomial. If you want to read it, the important thing is that it is a polynomial invariant that comes from a relative simplicial complex. And the other important fact is that it's known that if you do this power series construction for the Hilbert polynomial, the corresponding numerator polynomial is going to have non-negative coefficients whenever this relative simplicial complex is relatively Cohen-Macaulay. And of course, it is an open problem to figure out a combinatorial interpretation of those coefficients. But for the purposes of this talk, it's just nice to know that you get positivity. So what does it mean to be relatively Cohen-Macaulay? Well, here is the definition. Given a relative simplicial complex, we say it is relatively Cohen-Macaulay if it satisfies this condition. What does this condition state? It says if you take every face in your larger complex, and you compute these links, where this is the definition of a link, and you compute the corresponding relative homology groups, you're, they vanish 
below the dimension, the top dimension of the link of the larger complex. So the homology, relative homology is concentrated in the top dimension of the link. If it's your first time seeing the link definition of link before, Good news is our main theorem is that you don't have to think about links. So the summary so far is if we're, you can show that our polynomial is the Hilbert polynomial of a relative cohen macaulay complex for every object in your collection, then we're done. Uh, your polynomials all have non, your H polynomials all have non-negative integer coefficients. So the question is, how do you do that? And so the inspiration for this project came from uh, Einar Steingrenson's paper in 2001, where he focused on the chromatic polynomial graphs. So in there, the co collection of objects was graphs and the polynomial variant was chromatic polynomial. He showed that if you evaluate the chromatic polynomial at x plus one, you do get a Hilbert polynomial a relative simplicial complex. Here, the larger complex is called the, Cox, is the Coxeter complex of type A. Well, technically, it's the cone over that. And gamma was a new simplicial complex he introduced that he calls the coloring complex. Now, it is known that the Coxeter complex is shallable. And in 2005, Holtman showed that the coloring complex was shallable. And if you go through the theories, you can discover that the shallability results tell you that this relative pair is relatively Cohen-Macaulay. And so congratulations, you've now proven that these H polynomials for the chromatic, that you get from this chromatic polynomial by this series trick have non-negative integer coefficients. I admit it's already stated in Steingrimson's paper, he already gives a formula for those coefficients and he already cites other results where it had been independently discovered before. So one doesn't need to go through all this topology to prove it. But in our case, we want to use this topology in case there's cases where you can't find the combinatorial interpretation. So now we get to the main result. Our original problem was we have a collection of objects and we've got a bunch of polynomial invariants, one for each object. And we want to prove this non-negativity for these H polynomials all at once. So how, and we want to use this approach using uh, relative simplicial complexes. How are we going to do that? Well, the first part comes from what I presented at FIPSAC in 2016. Suppose that H, your collection of objects, forms what's called a geometric Hopf-monoid. Don't worry, I'll define what that is in a few slides. And that your polynomial, your favorite polynomial invariant are the ones that come from your Hopf monoid. Then yes, it turns out to be the case that there's an explicit relative simplicial complex for every one of your favorite combinatorial objects, such that when you evaluate the polynomial at x plus one, you get polynomial. I'm gonna to try to ignore this x plus one business and just say that these are Hilbert polynomials because it turns out there's a nice way to translate between the two different H polynomials. The main result from the uh, new presentation is this one. Suppose we have this next condition. For every object O, let's look at these relative simplicial complexes. And let's suppose we have the following two conditions. One, for every object O, suppose that the homology of the larger complex is concentrated in the top dimension. Two, for the subcomplex, when it's not empty, suppose that it's connected, pure, and has dimension one less than the larger complex. Suppose you've shown this for every object in your collection. Then congratulations. All of your relative simplicial complexes are relatively Cohen-Macaulay. You don't have to compute homology groups of links of all these relative simplicial complexes anymore. You just need to compute homology groups of the larger complex and then show something about connectivity. So it's a much simpler criterion. 
Of course, the rest of the talk, I have to explain what these terms mean, but this gives motivation for why this is a useful thing to study because you get some um, simpler criterion for what was originally a much more complicated de topological definition. Of course, this seems to be quite abstract at this point. So let's give a list of applications. Here's several different polynomial invariants that you could apply this theorem to and conclude that you get Hilbert polynomials of relatively cohen macaulay complexes. The, the chromatic polynomial of a graph. Well, of course, that's already known, but also the order polynomial of a poset, the Bolera Ja Reiner polynomial of the matroid, um, the basic polynomial of the generalized permutahedron, which was a polynomial invariant introduced by um, Marcello and Federico. And in the extended abstract, I focus mostly on the stromatic, the strong chromatic polynomial of the mixed graph. Of course, this theorem doesn't always work. So in the extended abstract, I focus on two examples where you do not get relatively Cohen-Macaulay complexes, namely the order polynomial of a double poset and the weak chromatic polynomial of a mixed graph. However, using our tech, my techniques, I'm still able to determine necessary incisions. So, if you give me a double post set, I can look at it and tell you if uh, its order polynomial comes from, it has Hilbert polynomial of a Cohen-Macaulay relative complex. And I can also give you examples where the H polynomials are negative, so it's as strong as possible. All right then, so now I need to define the terms in my theorem. So now we need to discuss what a Hopf monoid is. And so what is a Hopf monoid? Well, intuition for today is that you should think of a Hopf monoid as a collection of labeled combinatorial objects where you can combine objects and break them apart. And so there's two main resources, but the one that's more beneficial for combinatorists would be Hopf monoids in the category of species by Marcello and Swapnil. Um, for the legalese, I should point out that these objects are technically species, which means that they are functors from the category of finite sets with bijections to the category of vector spaces. But I will probably hide that fact from the rest of the talk and not focus too much on the category theory aspects. More importantly is that many hop monoids and species have this funny property that even though they involve vector spaces, the vector spaces usually have natural bases indexed by combinatorial objects. In the words of uh, Marcello Swapnil's work, they're what they call linearized. Moreover, in the cases I'm most interested in, usually the product of the basis elements gives you a basis element and the coproduct of a basis element is either a simple tensor of two basis elements or it's zero. So I'm going to try to simplify things and instead of talking about the full definition of a hop monoid and linear species, we're going to talk about what I'm calling a pre-linearized hop monoid. So a pre-linearized hop monoid partly consists of the following. For every finite set and you think of this as a node set or a vertex set. I prefer nodes because I like to use vertices for simplicial complexes and nodes for graphs. So for every finite node set, you have a collection H of N that consists of the combinatorial objects on those nodes. Then for each partition of N of your nodes into two disjoint subsets, you have a rule a multiplication map for how to combine combinatorial objects with those disjoint label sets. And you have a coproduct, which tells you how to decompose. Given a combinatorial object with label set N, you either get two combinatorial objects on label set S and T, or you get nothing. And so for the purposes of the linear algebra, nothing is zero. And it's going to have to satisfy a list of eight axioms. And I'll mention one of the axioms with a picture later in a few more slides. 
But first I wanna give some examples. So the three most popular examples I often give are graphs, post sets, and matroids. For time constraints, I'm going to focus the most on post sets. In the um, extended abstract, I give a few new examples as well. I'd like to mention there's a nice paper by Marcelo and Federico from 2017 where they show that generalized permutahedra also form a Hopf monoid. So for graphs, the product is disjoint union given two graphs on disjoint label sets, a natural way to combine them is to just take their union. And a way to break a graph apart is to take induced subgraphs. And there's a similar thing for post sets and matroids. So for post sets, the construction is as follows. Given a finite node set N, P of N consists of all partial orders on N. How do you multiply two partial orders? Well, just take their disjoint union. That's a natural way to combine two partial orders and disjoint sets. Take the co-product. Well, if S is a lower order ideal, then you take induced subpost sets. So here is my post set on the set of the letters in the word duck. U forms a lower order ideal, so I take this induced subpost set and I take the complementary induced subpost sets. And these are my two terms, corresponding to S being this and T being CDK. If S is not a lower order ideal, for instance, in this case, CD is not a lower order ideal because U is below it and is not in the set, then I define the whole product to be zero. And so the whole reason I allow zero is so that I can apply my theory to examples like post sets. All right, so there's the product and co-product structure for the Hopf monoid of post sets. One of the axioms for a Hopf monoid in species is that the product and co-product have to be compatible. And a way to describe that with an example with post sets is as follows. I have two post sets on the left and the right. I multiply them, which means I take the disjoint union. And then I take a co-product, which means I decompose them somehow. So I'm taking a lower order ideal of this union and I'm taking two induced sub post sets. And so now I have two separate post sets. Then compatibility says I should get the same results if first I take this induced sub post sets on the left post set, the induced sub post sets on the right post set, and then I combine horizontally. So there is a brief crash course into the notion of Hopf monoids and species. And so one thing you ask is what can you do with this abstract theory? Well, one thing you can do is make polynomials. And the key ingredient in a polynomial is that you need a character. So what is a character? It's a collection of functions, one for every node set. So you're associating a number to every combinatorial object in your set, and your rule is that it is multiplicative. The number you associate to the combination of two objects is supposed to be the product of the numbers you associate to the objects. A basic example would be coming from post sets. If um, you define the character on post sets to be one when P is an anti-chain and zero otherwise. You can see that the disjoint union of two post sets is an anti-chain if and only if both the individual post sets is an empty chain. So you do have a character. Given a character, a natural way to create a polynomial is to consider all the ways to break your common, favorite combinatorial object into k parts and apply your character to each part. Given a non-negative integer k, you sum over all set decompositions of n into k parts where here we are allowing the subsets to possibly be empty. You take what's called the k-fold co-product. This means you're bit breaking O into k pieces. And then you're applying your invariant to each piece. And so you're getting a number and you're summing over a bunch of numbers. It is known that you end up getting a polynomial invariant. And in the case of post sets, this co-product 
sort of corresponds to this order decomposition because you can only take and do sub post sets coming from order ideals. And these characters uh, delete into sub post sets that are not anti chains. So you're getting some sort of order decomposition into anti chains. If you think about it for a while, you will discover that the resulting polynomial invariant is the strict order polynomial. And yes, a lot of our favorite polynomial invariants all can be constructed from this method as coming from a character assigned to a Hopf-monoid in species. Of course, if you're familiar with combinatorial Hopf algebras, the same thing is true for combinatorial Hopf algebras. So usually the question is, what more do you get Hopf-monoid in species? So I will explain what more you get in a moment. But right now I want to summarize let me rephrase my question from the introduction. Now given a Hopf monoid and a character, I have this polynomial invariant. I write down these series and I get these numerator polynomials. When are these numerator polynomials non-negative integer polynomial for all objects in my collection? Well, here was my Here's the definition of a geometric Hopf monoid. You're only allowed to take on character values zero and one. And if the coproduct is non-zero and the character value is one, then this corresponding character value of the coproduct also must be one. There's actually a slightly more general definition I could give, but this is sufficient for this talk. And so the theorem I gave at FIPSEC in 2016 was much more complicated than this, but this is actually the much more simpler equivalent version. So suppose you have a geometric Hopf monoid and you have an object in one of your sets. So this is a combinatorial object with late uh, node set M. Then there exists a relative simplicial complex such that when you evaluate this character polynomial at X plus one, you get the Hilbert polynomial. Some points about the construction. The vertices correspond to subsets of nodes where the coproduct is non-zero. The faces of my larger complex are going to correspond to chains of subsets. So I have to say in advance, the construction is rather complicated, but the construction of the coloring complex was too. Finally, it's actually better to describe the set difference. So the faces that are in the larger complex, but not the smaller one. So what is the definition? Well, here it is. The intuition is uh, given one of these chains in our complex, what you want to do is you break O into pieces based on this set decomposition. The set decomposition SI is what happens when you take, uh, it's all the new elements appearing in fi that we're not in fi minus one. So s0 is f1, s1 is f2 minus f1, so on and so forth, up to sk being n take away fk. So what do you do? You get all these faces such that when you take corresponding coproduct and this corresponding character evaluations, you get one. If you look at my duck post set, the resulting relative simplicial complex is in fact the sim relative simplicial complex I gave earlier. Almost, I'm missing two vertices, the empty set and the full set. And so you have to take the double cone over this. But once you take the double cone, you have an example of a relative simplicial complex coming from this construction. And now we have my main theorem. Uh, Suppose you have a geometric Hopf monoid. Suppose we have these two conditions. For i less than the top dimension of my large complex, the homology is zero for every object in my Hopf monoid. Second, for whenever the subcomplex is non-empty, then it has to be connected pure and dimension less than the top dimension. Then in fact, all these relative simplicial complexes are Cohen-Macaulay. 
and I suspect I'm almost out of time. So in the interest of time, I have on the full slides one last line about the attempt at the proof. But I think I will stop there. So thank you. Thank you. the word to, to Dan for questions. Uh, all right, thank you, Jacob. Uh, there is a question in the chat from Aditya Kana. Do you want to unmute yourself, Aditya, to, to ask it? Or if you don't have a microphone, Hi. I can ask it for you. Does it work? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I I just don't know how to actually take a subcomplex of a simplicial complex. So. Like, what are the restrictions if you're given a simplicial complex? What do you mean? Uh, any sub, uh, you just take another so, collection of eight, right? Fine. So it needs to be connected though, right? Or could I just take two? Any, any sub, any disconnected simplices. It doesn't have to be connected. Oh, okay. Uh, there is another question from uh, Yosha Deal. Who? Uh, well, do you want to ask it yourself, Yosha? Yes, thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, why is it called geometric Hopf-Mortenoid? Uh, well, because the the theorem that every single last one of the uh, polynomial invariants ends up being a Hilbert polynomial of a relative simplicial complex. And uh, I think that there are no other questions. So uh, let us thank the speaker again and I'll give it back to Matias for, for our next uh, speaker. <laughs>